morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath again. Our uh, scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 4, if you'd like to turn with me. So Exodus chapter 4. It's going to look wrong if I read it from Genesis, so let me try Exodus. Um, Exodus chapter 4, reading from verses 10 down to verse 13. So Exodus 4, verses 10 to 13. But Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been a skilled speaker. Even now, after talking to you, I cannot speak well. I speak slowly, and I have a heavy tongue. And then the Lord said to him, Who made a person's mouth, and who makes someone deaf or not able to speak, or who gives a person sight or blindness? It is I, the Lord. Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Please, Lord, send someone else. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word today. So a few weeks ago, uh, Katya and I, we went with our girls into Edinburgh, uh, it was a Sunday, and so we were going to go, and we spent the, uh, the afternoon at the National Museum in Edinburgh, which is a fantastic day out if anybody um, ever finds himself in Edinburgh. It's a wonderful place. There's always so much to see. The girls love it, so it's great for kids as well. Um, fantastic place. Lots to learn there. But that was in the afternoon. In the morning, we decided that we were going to drop in and we were going to visit a, uh, a new church that there is in, in Edinburgh, a Sunday keeping church, um, which is famous for its good music, uh, its good worship. So we went to find out if their worship was as good as it's supposed to be. And it was. It was very good. We very much enjoyed ourselves. Um, it was the second week that they'd been having proper services. Um, and they had, I mean, it was only... 350 people in attendance. It's a small congregation, as you can imagine, or a rather large congregation. When you consider that's more than double the size of even the biggest Adventist church in Scotland, then it was quite impressive to us. But what was most interesting to me about the whole day was actually what the, their pastor who preached that day, what he had to say. He had some, uh, a very interesting point to bring forward. And what he did have to say that day, he pulled from uh, historical information. And when I found out that there was a book, of course I went ahead and bought the book um, because I can't resist a good book. So um, I'd like to pull something from this today. You see, the four, uh, the, most of the people who were in there that day, the 350 of us who were in this auditorium in the Rose Theatre, which is just at the end of Princes Street, Most of us had absolutely no idea of the significance of the building that we were in. It was only later on the way out, having had this pointed out to me, that I saw the sign that was on the building telling us what it once was. Because this place wasn't built as a theater. Um, It was rather converted to one only a couple of years ago. In fact, it was built in 1912 for the grand sum of about 7,000 pounds, which was an awful lot of money back in those days. And it was built as something else entirely. It was built as the Charlotte Baptist Chapel, and it was built on the site of the old Charlotte Baptist Chapel. Why was it built on the site of the old Baptist Chapel? I hear you ask, or I hear you think at least. Well, the the simple answer is, the old one was too small. Now, change can be an interesting thing. As human beings, we have a bad habit of swinging wildly between two complete opposites. Sometimes we are so comfortable where we are that we don't even want to poke our head out from underneath the duvet. We're just nice and warm and snug and we don't want to move, we don't want to get out, we're completely happy where we are. And then we hop between that and running after the newest and latest thing, this new gadget and widget has, is slightly better than last year's one, so I have to have it, it's absolutely important, so change happens at a rapid rate in some things. Sometimes we change our mind on a daily basis about some things. I mean, much change is necessary, so if I don't get out from my warm duvet each morning, I imagine that my boss might have a few words to say to me, And among those words are probably something along the lines of, you're fired. 
Um, conversely, much change makes absolutely no difference to us whatsoever. So we feel that some things, thanks to marketing hype, um, we think that something is, ver is absolutely necessary for our very survival, and yet reality is that it was hardly better than the last one, and the last one we hardly ever used, so why do we bother buying a new one? So the question each of us has to work out, the answer to, probably multiple times each and every day, is whether the change that is before us is something that we need to embrace or something that we should resist. Getting out, of the bed, getting out of bed in the morning is something that should be easy enough. You probably set your alarm for a very good reason. So if the alarm has gone off, then the answer is, yes, you should get out of bed. If you still have a couple of hours before you need to get up, then the answer is no. You can go back and you can stay nice and warm under your duvet for another couple of hours. Knowing whether to buy the latest patent pending gadget or not is often easy enough as well. The answer is, occasionally and particularly when it relates to something that you know you use on a regular basis. But how about other decisions in life, the important things? Do we rush ahead or do we run away? See, Moses, he got it wrong at least twice in his life, which is fantastic for us because that means we get to learn from his mistakes. The first time in Exodus chapter 2, um, a oh. famous story that many of you will have read about in as children or have heard the story before. So Exodus chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. It says, Moses grew and became a man. One day he visited his people and saw that they were forced to work very hard. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew man, one of Moses' own people. Moses looked all around and saw that no one was watching, so he killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. See, after he was protected by God as a baby, using the very river that his cousins were being murdered in, Moses spent some 40 years being trained in Pharaoh's court as a potential leader of the Egyptian empire, probably the biggest power in the world in those days. Yet, of course, because Moses, the very beginning of his life, he was raised by his birth mother, he knew his real heritage. And when he saw a chance for change, for improving the world, for making the world a better place, particularly for his own people, and particularly when no one was looking, he lashed out and he killed someone. See, his rashness as he ran into trying to change things on his own power ended up causing nothing but pain. He was shunned by his own people who had no idea what he was trying to do, and his time in Pharaoh's household also came to an end as he couldn't hang around after killing an Egyptian guard. Now this is a clear example of man trying to change things on God's behalf and screwing things up in the process. Can you imagine, I mean we don't know here, but can you imagine what might have been if Moses had waited on God's providence instead of acting out on his own? Might it be possible that Moses would have lived in his life in the palace in luxury and through accident, battle or disease, all of his brothers and others in the line to the throne would end up deceased or out of the way, and he would end up being the heir to the throne. Can you imagine what the Exodus story might have looked like if you'd had a Hebrew pharaoh sat on the throne, and then God said, let my people go? We would have avoided the ten plagues and instead have had a joyous procession through the streets as the children of Israel set off for the promised land. Would King Moses have shown up at the edge of Canaan with the tablets of stone in his hand and the people of God would have marched in with all the Canaanites saying, come on in, and recognizing Jehovah as their God as well? And obviously, this is pure speculation on my part. I have absolutely no idea what God's original plan was. But anything is possible with God and I'm sure that God's plan would have been a lot less painful than what ended up happening. See, we know that God wanted to take his people back to the land that he had promised their ancestor Abraham. If Moses had followed God instead of leading God, how much more painless would the whole process have been? So what should we learn from this story? Well, we learn that when God has plans, we don't try and outthink God and try to make, take shortcuts to get to the destination. But that's not the only part of the story that Moses helps us with. He also helps us on the other side because it's not just in his action that he can teach us something, but also his inaction. Some 40 years later, 
God picks things up with Moses by visiting God through the middle of a bush. What might have happened in a palace ended up happening in the middle of the wilderness while Moses was trying to keep an eye on his father's less than intelligent sh- his father-in-law's less than intelligent sheep. God showed himself to Moses, his very presence making the dust around the bush in the desert holy. God appears to Moses in the fire and the voice comes to him telling him what he must do. God has a mission for Moses to complete, but Moses was hesitant. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Moses said to God, Well, when I go to the Israelites, I will say to them, The God of your ancestors sent me to you. But what if the people say, What is his name? What should I tell them? And then God said to Moses, I am who I am. When you go to the people of Israel, tell them, I am has sent you. God is so patient with Moses as he reassures him and explains to him what must be done. If you look through this in Exodus, it's actually quite a long dialogue that is written out. And it isn't flattering for Moses, which is quite something considering he was the one who wrote it. In fact, it is so long that eventually God starts to raise his voice with Moses. But, and then that's from uh, starting in verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord... Please, Lord, I've never been a skilled speaker. Even now, after talking to you, I cannot speak well. I speak slowly and can't find the best words. Then the Lord said to him, Who made a person's mouth? And who makes someone deaf or not able to speak? Or who gives a person's sight or blindness? It is I, the Lord. Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Please, Lord, send someone else. And then in verse 14, the Lord became angry with Moses and said, your brother Aaron from the family of Levi is a skilled speaker. He is already coming to meet you and he will be happy when he sees you. You will speak to Aaron and tell him what to say. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. Aaron will speak to the people for you. You will tell him what God says and he will speak for you. Please, Lord, send someone else. That is the sum of Moses' response to the power of God talking through a supernatural phenomenon in the form of a burning bush that doesn't burn. Isn't that sad? God has a plan to use Moses, and while Moses had been so ready to do things on his own 40 years before, now that he has the power of God behind him explicitly, he wants to go back to his sheep. God ended up having to drag Aaron into things and using what to us, maybe it looks like plan B, but in reality, it may have been plan Z, as we have no idea how many others rejected the call before Moses eventually accepted, even if somewhat reluctantly. God's plans are so much bigger and better than we can imagine, which brings me back to the Charlotte Baptist Chapel on Rose Street in Edinburgh. See, in the early 1900s, they found themselves without a pastor and with dwindling numbers. Their congregation had already been, ar- been around for over 100 years, but their once-packed 450-seat hall housed less than 100 most Sundays for their main service. And their 7 o'clock in the morning prayer meeting was much, much worse, with a mere three people coming each week, and had long since moved from the hall to the small vestry just so that they could stay relatively warm. They weren't the only Christian church in Edinburgh, and not even the only Baptist church, So it wouldn't have been the end of the world if they had just closed the doors or downsized. I am of the opinion, however, that when a church looks on the point of closure, like even this one did, well, not all that long ago, that is not the moment to resist God and stay under your duvet. And thankfully for them, their secretary, he had the same view. A few years earlier, at some meetings in the hall, an English pastor had commented, God pity the man who pastors this church. Now, that very man, a man named Joseph Kemp, was asked to move north of the border and take lead of this failing congregation. There's a quote from the book. says, in an interview between the two men, Joseph Kemp said, if I come, I must have an absolutely free hand. Andrew Urquhart, who was the, um, uh, the secretary, he replied that he could have a free hand on one condition. Kemp asked, what is that condition? And Urquhart replied, that you preach the gospel. And so it was. 
Kemp took the pulpit and he began the work of the gospel. At a couple of years into his ministry, he traveled south for his health at one point. He was getting quite sick. And he did what most people normally would do in those days, in the Victorian era, when they're sick, they went to Bournemouth to go and have the bracing sea air and to, to recover. However, he got bored with all of the invalids in Bournemouth, and so he went to Wales instead, where there was a widespread revival that was going on. God was working very, very powerfully in many, many churches across Wales. And he wrote about this experience. He said, In Wales, I saw the people had learned to sing in a new way, which was new, in a way which was new to me. I never heard such singing as theirs. They sang such old familiar hymns as when I survey the wondrous cross and there is a fountain filled with blood and I need thee, oh, I need thee. They needed no organist or choir or leader. Their singing was natural. The Holy Ghost was in their singing as much as in any other exercise. They had the new song. The world knows nothing of it. Do not tell me that sporting clubs, the dance halls, the movies and operas can give you joy. Joy is the gift of God. When a revival from God visits a congregation, it brings with it joy. Seeing God working in others is to me one of the most powerful forces for inner revival. Seeing others... <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Seeing others on fire is what brought me to realize the empty religion that I had grown up with, within my own experience some 15 years ago. Seeing others on fire today is changing the way I live and breathe today. For Kemp, seeing the revival in Wales led him to greater action, not more rest, which was why he was supposed to be in Wales in the first place. The joy that comes from revival was more than enough for him. Prayer ended up becoming such a central tenet of the church that just a few years later we read from their, their own um, newspaper they had, what am I to report about our wonderful prayer meetings? Did anyone, did anyone see such meetings? They used to begin at seven o'clock on Sunday mornings, but that was felt to be far too late in the day for the great business that had to be transacted before the throne of heavenly grace. The meetings now begin at six o'clock and go on for almost seven days a week with occasional intervals to attend to business, household duties, and bodily sustenance. Some of you who are strangers may smile. Many of us did, but we don't now. It is that continuous, persevering, God-honoring weekly campaign of prayer that has moved the mighty hand of God to pour upon this, pe this favored people the blessings of his grace in such rich abundance. And if you ever should be asked the secret of this church's great spiritual prosperity, you can tell them of the prayer meetings, and especially of the gatherings of God's people, 40 to 60 strong, in the upper vestry every Sunday morning at 6 o'clock, summer and winter, wet day and fine, to pray. Yes, that is the secret, the secret of our church's success and prosperity. See, their concentration on prayer led naturally into study of the Bible and preaching the gospel. They marched up and down Prince's Street, singing hymns and bringing drunks into church. They preached from street corners. They gave out leaflets. They ran charitable programs to help the poor, to help the drunkards at the many pubs that there were on Rose Street. And also the girls had been reduced to prostitution as well. During 1905 especially, revival spread through the church and people gave their hearts to God almost every single day throughout the following year. At one big evangelistic campaign, it was made sure that besides the preaching in the large rented hall, those, those who would come would also receive longer-term sustenance to firm them in the Christian walk to become disciples of Christ. And for, from the, um, the write-up of this said, mature Christians offered advice on how to grow in the faith under three headings, good food, which is Bible study, good air, which is prayer, and good exercise, which is Christian service. See, we need all three of these things to be healthy, functioning Christians. Otherwise, we are just hiding under the duvet, hoping that any responsibilities that we have in this world will work themselves out. Let me make it plain to you. God's ultimate will is going to happen. The question you need to answer is, do you want to be part of it or not? We can't run to what we think God wants and mess things up, and we can't resist against what God wants and mess things up. We need to listen to him and follow where his spirit leads us. See, the attendance at Charlotte Chapel became so great, they had to knock it down and build a bigger one. 
they built a 1500 seat building and God filled it to bursting point. God worked in wonderful ways, leading to missionaries sent all over the world, leading to social reforms in Edinburgh, leading to so many giving their lives to God who ended up spread across dozens of different churches, across dozens of different denominations in Edinburgh. Their revival wasn't lasting for the congregation, unfortunately. And in 2016, they moved into a more manageable former Church of Scotland building nearby. The hall is now a theatre with a strong emphasis on dance, ballet, and that kind of thing. So compared to the 1,500 who were packed that, the packed that used to be in there, the 350 who were quite comfortable that we saw wasn't quite so special after all. The pastor of this congregation that we visited told his congregation that despite such large churches existing all over the country at the turn of the 20th century, in Scotland today, he could not find a single church in the whole country with over 1,000 attendees. In fact, we know from other research that Christian churches in Scotland in general are currently losing attendees at the rate of 1,000 people every single month. And that is a mix of, well, old people dying and young people giving up. The Adventist Church in Scotland is growing slowly, so we are beating the trend, but we are still far short of even having 1,000 in total. Does anybody here suppose that this is God's plan for Christianity in this country? Or even for Christianity in the Western world, as this is hardly a purely Scottish thing? Is the plan of the Almighty that after 2,000 years, Christianity in the Western Hemisphere should simply fizzle out? I do not believe that for a second. And I don't think any of you do. So what should we do about it? Well, to make a real and lasting difference, the answer of what we can do is absolutely nothing. <laughs> like so many things in our Christian walk, we can't do anything ourselves. Our actions can't touch hearts. Our words can't change minds. So what does the work is God working through us and in us. Let me give you one last quote from this book. Alan Redpath, who was the pastor of the chapel from 1962 until 1966, regularly said that if you want to move a boat when there is little or no wind, you had to row it. So a congregation has two, two duties. One, to set the sails to catch the wind of God's revival. And two, in the meantime, to row the boat for all one's worth. As a church here in Dunfermline, and as a district with Edinburgh and Musselburgh, we are at an interesting juncture. Tomorrow morning, in fact, we start the first formal activities of outreach as the first life group goes for a walk around the Harlow Reservoir, just south of Edinburgh. On Tuesday, there will be discipleship groups in three different locations going on. There will be at least two on Tuesday, two on Thursday, and uh, two, on when two on Wednesday, two on Thursday, and two on Friday as well. There are groups for the youth, groups for groups where your children will be taken care of, groups for those who are not ready to dive into God's word yet. In short, there is a place for every single one of us. Now, I know most of you haven't really seen the Bible studies that we're going to go through in most of the groups, but I can tell you that these are fantastic. They are practical. They have real application to our daily lives, and they ask the right questions. They truly are aimed at making disciples of Christ rather than just trying to carbon copy Adventists. It's not making Adventists, it's making disciples. We aren't feeling the winds of revival, the wind of the Spirit rushing through this place, yet. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I feel butterflies in the pit of my stomach. I can't wait to see what God has in store for us in these next weeks. Now, I know it doesn't happen as often up here in Scotland, but I remember very vividly in the early 90s down south, there was a series of very hot and long dry summers. There was no rain at all. There was hosepipe bounds all around. It was great for us as kids because that meant over the summer holidays we could play outside for the entire time. But from time to time it would rain. And it wouldn't just rain a little bit. The thing is, before the rain hit, you could feel it. You could, it was like the air was alive. And then you could smell it. The smell of wet earth the smell of rain coming. Our house, we were at the kind of the end of a T, so we could see a 
quarter mile down the, down the road. And I remember being in our front garden and watching the rain like a sheet just coming up the road towards us. I remember hearing it when it hit the corrugated iron, a corrugated tin roof that we had on our carport in front of the house. I remember feeling the warmth of it on my skin. See, there is no guarantee that my feelings are anything to go by. But that is, in all honesty, how I feel at the moment. I feel like the sky is turning yellow, the breeze is picking up, and I feel like I can smell rain coming. There's an interesting thing written by um, Ellen White, one of the founders of our church, when she was talking about the day of Pentecost. After she described um, what happened to the disciples on that day in the book Acts of the Apostles, she carries on and talks about an application for our day as well. She said, from the beginning, God has been working by his Holy Spirit through human instrumentalities to for the accomplishment of his purpose in behalf of the fallen race. This was manifest in the lives of the patriarchs. To the church in the wilderness also, in the time of Moses, God gave his good spirit to instruct them, which is Nehemiah 9.20. In the days of the apostles, he wrought mightily for his church through the agency of the Holy Spirit. The same power that sustained the patriarchs that gave Caleb and Joshua faith and courage, that made the work of the apostolic church effective, has upheld God's faithful children in every succeeding age. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit that during the Dark Ages, the Waldensian Christians helped to prepare the way for the Reformation. It was the same power that made successful the efforts of the noble men and women who pioneered the way for the establishment of modern missions and for the translation of the Bible into languages and dialects of all nations and people. And today, God is still using his church to make, his, make known his purpose in the earth. Today, the heralds of the cross are going from city to city and from land to land, preparing the way for the second advent of Christ. The standard of God's law is being exalted. The spirit of the Almighty is moving upon men's hearts, and those who respond to its influence become witnesses for God and his truth. In many places, consecrated men and women may be seen communicating to others the light that has been made plain to them through the way of salvation through Christ. And they continue to let their light shine, as did those who were baptized with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They receive more and still more of the Spirit's power. Thus the earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. On the other hand, there are some who instead of wisely improving present opportunities, are idly waiting for some special season of spiritual refreshing, refreshing, by which their ability to enlighten others will be greatly increased. They neglect present duties and privileges and allow their light to burn dim while they look forward to a time when, without any effort on their part, they will be made the recipients of a special blessing by which they will be transformed and fitted for service. It is true that in the, end, in the time of the end, when God's work in, on the, in the earth is closing, the earnest efforts put forth by consecrated believers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are to be accomplished by special tokens of divine favor. Under the figure of the early and latter rain that falls in the eastern lands at seed time and then at harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of spiritual grace in extraordinary measure upon God's church. <clears throat> The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the beginning of the early or former reign, and glorious was the result. To the end of time, the presence of the Spirit is to abide with the true church. But near the close of, God, of, the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain, and it is for this added power that Christians are to send their petitions to the Lord of the harvest in the time of the latter rain. In response, the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. He will cause to come down the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, which is Zechariah 10 and Joel 2. But unless the members of God's church today have a living connection with the source of all spiritual growth, they will not be ready for the time of reaping. Unless they keep their lamps trimmed and burning, they will fail of receiving added grace in times of special need. Those only who are constantly receiving fresh supplies of grace will have power proportionate to their daily need and their ability to use that power. Instead of looking forward to some future time when, through a special endowment of spiritual power, they will receive a miraculous fitting up for soul winning, they are yielding themselves daily to God, that he may make of them vessels meet for his use. Daily they are improving the opportunities for service that lie within their reach. 
Daily they are witnessing for the master wherever they may be, whether in some humble sphere of labor in the home or in a public field of usefulness. To the consecrated worker, there is wonderful consolation in the knowledge that even Christ, during his life on earth, sought his Father daily for fresh supplies of needed grace. And from this communion with God, he went forth to strengthen and bless others. Behold, the Son of God bowed in prayer to his Father. Though he is the Son of God, he strengthens his faith by prayer, and by communion with heaven gathers to himself power to resist evil and to minister to the needs of men. As the elder brother of our race, he knows the necessities of those who, compassed with infirmity and living in a world of sin and temptation, still desire to serve him. He knows that the messengers whom he sees fit to send are weak, erring men, but to all who give themselves wholly to his service, he promises divine aid. His own example is an assurance that earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith, faith that leads to entire dependence upon God, an unreserved consecration to his work will avail to bring, men, bring to men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle of sin. Every worker who follows the example of Christ will be prepared to receive and use that, the power that God has promised to his church for the ripening of earth's harvest. Morning by morning, as the heralds of the gospel kneel before the Lord and renew their vows of consecration to him, he will grant them the presence of his spirit with its reviving, sanctifying power. As they go forth to the day's duties, they have the assurance that the unseen agency of the Holy Spirit enables them to be laborers together with God. See, today we have a wonderful opportunity before us to move forward as a church in faith, in power, and in God's plan for our lives. I believe that every one of us should do everything we can to get involved in one of these studies whether at Grace's house on Tuesday nights, whether here at the church on Thursday nights, or at one of the other locations that there are, either in Fife or over in Edinburgh. Every single one of us needs to put up our sails and be ready for the Holy Spirit to give us the power that we know he wills to do. We need to prepare our hearts and give ourselves to God. I don't know how many of you took up Gabriel's challenge to cut out worldly entertainment for 40 days and replace it with God's word. Well, today is day 40 for those who started on the 1st of January, but it is not too late to start today to dedicate time to God. From my own experience these last weeks, I can personally personally vouch for how much of a blessing it has been. We need to pray, especially at this time. We need to pray for the work that is going on in this part of the world. If anyone can't make it to any of these meetings, please find a way to pray. Pray that people's lives are changed and that God will transform hearts and draw people closer to him. Pray that the Holy Spirit will be poured out in this district, starting with yourself and your family. Pray for those who are coming. Pray for those who have been asked to come. Pray for those who will be asked to come in the future. We have neighbors and friends who we are praying for with that very purpose in mind. But we can't do only that. Setting the sails to catch the wind of God's revival is not the only thing that we need to do. We also need to row for all we are worth. Please support this work of evangelism. In the group that Gabriel started in his house last year, it isn't a lecture where Gabriel imparts his knowledge to us, but rather every single one of us shares and we grow together. Your participation in the discipleship groups isn't just important to you. It's also important for whoever it is who's going to be sat next to you each evening. It's in, um, going for a walk or going bowling or coming to a tea party or playing games or whatever the activity is will affect the lives of everyone else who is there as well as brighten up your day. Don't resist God's call for you today. Don't say, please, Lord, send someone else. But say, here I am, Lord, send me. Get out of bed. The alarm is going off. I... I'm genuinely excited, and I want each of you to be excited for what God is excited to do in this part of the world. He loves each one of us so much, and he will pour out his spirit, and he desires that you are part of it. Set your sails and row for all that you're worth. After all, it's not our boat, but it is his. Ephesians 3, 19 to 21. Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know, but I pray that you will be able to know that love. Then you can be filled with the fullness of God. 
With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Our most kind and righteous Father in heaven, we, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your patience with us. And more than anything else, we thank you that you are moving in our lives. We thank you that the second coming is not some far off distant thing, but it is, it is near at hand. We know that we have a work to do. We know that you have something you want each and every one of us to do to be part of, of your plan for us. That there is so much you want to do here in this part of the world. Did you just may you may you send your spirit upon us. May we feel the the latter rain. May we be able to move forward in power and knowing you. But while we are setting the sails and while we're waiting for your revival, that we will also work for you today, that we may labor for you from the dawn till setting sun. Let us as we talk of all your wondrous love and care. So that when this life is over and all our work on earth is done and the role is called up yonder, that we, that each, every single one of us will be there. May we hear the alarm. May we, uh, may we come out from an, our, our comfort and move into where you want us to be. May we make the sacrifice that, that we need to make to, to be part of this movement, to be part of your, your leading in this part of the world. We know that there are so many in our midst who are, have, have challenges in their lives, who are, have, have so many difficulties. We, we know of, um, of Debbie, we know of Phyllis, we know that um, Michelle is going through a difficult time at the moment and so many of us are struggling, but we have something that is more important than anything that could be happening to us at the moment because we know that you want to to send revival fire upon, upon this part of the world, that you want to set the world aflame and that you want, to, you want people to know who you are again, that you want your name to be proclaimed and all glory given to you. May you use us, may you touch our hearts and may we, with the, the small amount of rowing that we are able to do, may you bless and then send the, the wind of revival so that we may go forward in power. This we ask as we leave this place in Jesus' name.